reports went home either Friday or today and it was an opportunity for families to speak to their child sort of evaluate how their start of the year has been and maybe set some goals moving forward the best news is for students there's no school this Friday you get an extra long weekend I hope you enjoy your time teachers will be here all day on Friday our day is composed in the morning of an SEL, which is social emotional learning, in the morning the entire district will be engaged in what I like to say is taking a risk, technology risk, and I was told to change that. It's now a technology opportunity. So if things don't go well, it was an opportunity. Uh, the afternoon we will be working through our Google platform, so staff will be here, but students have a four-day weekend. Also. Families need to be aware, fire and Alice drills are beginning to occur. City safety is a major focus for the school department, and as we conduct inspections and drills, we are asking for feedback and suggestions for improvement. Drills will occur throughout the year to better prepare us should such an occurrence happen. The first Alice drill this year will be announced to families, second and thirds will not. So please start having those conversations with your students. And lastly, um, as I can attest to, the weather is already changing for us. We're going between hot and cold and rainy. Uh, we're watching students already start to, whether it's uh, seasonal flu, allergies, just make sure your children are dressed appropriately in which to handle the weather so that they're comfortable in their classroom. And we have two celebrations this evening. This one was a little bit of a secret. Carlos? Could I have you come up, please? This is Carlos Silvera, and the secrecy was due to him, so you can feel free to ask him questions. <laughs> After more than 20 years of living here and a Lemster High School graduate, Carlos Silvera, Lemster High School teacher, 
officially became a citizen of the United States on September 19th. about it, about the process, due to potential tension. This process has been a major and positive focus for him. Carlos is excited to have permanent status and is looking forward to casting his voting rights this November. I commend his quote, I feel like I finally have a seat at the table. Congratulations, Carlos. Thank Not you. only are we proud of you, but you are a role model. Thank you. Congratulations. That's awesome. Anybody have questions for Carlos? <laughs> I'll be taking questions after. <laughs> I think this is phenomenal. Yes. Thank you. Having you as my grandson's teacher, I think you're doing a splendid job. Thank you. And I think you have a lot to show the whole community of what it means to be a citizen. Yes. I appreciate that. We're very wonderful. proud of you. Very proud of you. Thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. Absolutely. I will absolutely, if you guys want, let me know on the school uh, <laughs> on the school site. So if you want to get in touch with me or have any questions about the process or what it means or what it doesn't mean and anything like that, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to talk about it now. So, <laughs> so helpful hint, if you have a secret, you never tell Dr. Dubzinski. Yes. Right. <laughs> he ran to the phone and called me and said what you were doing. And so we kept it a secret just in case, um, but it, it's exciting news. Thank, thank you. I wasn't sure. going to tell anybody until after it would be uh, <laughs> Once again, we told Dr. Dubzinski. Same time, so. Can we grab a photo? Sure, sure. And then we have one more celebration, Dr. D, correct? Yep. So in June, Grace Juma represented Lemonster High School and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the Congress of Future Medical Leaders in Boston, Mass. I am delighted to enclose this and hand off this great, very impressive certificate of which she has been waiting for. And if you give me just a moment, um, Grace was surrounded by many fellow high school students who share her passion, ability, and potential. So many delegates found new friends to help them uh, reach their dreams and future colleagues, hopefully in the future. And this is the, really the sentence that got to me because I could not have done this. She watched live surgery, and many delegates had a chance to question the surgeon in real time. Not for me, but apparently for Grace. So, <laughs> congratulations. Oh, I'm in 11th grade. Very good. That's great. Great. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. I appreciate that. One more picture? Yeah. That's wonderful. Wait, what was the surgery you watched? It was a live hysterectomy. Oh, wow. Oh, what was the hysterectomy? Really? Okay. Where are you? Just a major surgery. Hello, my name is Connor Marshan. I am a senior at LHS, and I'm going to do the student report. Um, so for the sports update, we've been phenomenal lately in sports, both in and out of school. Our girls volleyball team and our boys soccer have been off to a great start. Our school spirit has been great, great crowds at our games where they're both having fun and being respectful. Uh, we received our progress reports today. Uh, last week we had our inner class plays, which was a very big turnout. Uh, also, which we just went over, our teacher, Carlos Silvera, got his citizenship, which was awesome. Um, uh, we just received our MCAS results, which <coughs> we feel really good about the results, but we are never satisfied. We will strive to increase our scores each and every year. 
We also last weekend at the JA Festival where we had clubs and different organizations have their own booths where they fundraised and promoted what they're going for. Some examples were Stump, the National Honor Society, and Best Buddies, which I did, which we had pumpkins and you could pay to you could donate to the Best Buddies program and paint a pumpkin, which you could bring then bring home and do whatever you need to do with it. <laughs> um, we also have been our guidance counselors have been doing great having helping the seniors start our college applications and opening our common app which a lot of us don't know what we're doing so they've been great helping us with that we also have our homecoming coming up on october 20th which we have an all-day event at the field where we have different a bunch of different sporting events and games including field hockey soccer and to end it off with the football game against shepherd hill and we'd love all the support and other than that it's been a great year and the students and Faculty are excited for the way the year has to bring to us, and that's it. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all to Samoset, the school committee, and also the families that have come tonight. Just a couple of introductions. The assistant principal is Nelson Oliver. I'm sure most of you know him. And then we also have our art teacher, Sherry Bluen, who's sitting hiding in the back there. But she's generally present at absolutely everything and supporting everything that we do. We have a few students who are going to introduce themselves to you, and they want to talk about some things that are specific to Samoset. And we're going to start with the first two young ladies who are eager to get going. Okay, come on up. <laughs> we should say thank you for our kids. Yeah. Well, you'll hear that in a minute. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for that. Hello, I'm Abby, and I'm Sarah, and we're seventh grade students here. You may be wondering about the pins in front of you. Well, we're going to tell you about them. As is well known as throughout the world, Harvey Ball, a commercial artist from Worcester, Massachusetts, created the smiley face in 1963. That image went on to become the most recognizable symbol of goodwill and good cheer on the planet. As the years passed, Harvey Ball became concerned about the over-commercialization of his symbol. And now its original meaning and intent had become lost in the constant repetition of the marketplace. Out of that concern came his idea for World Smile Day. He thought that we, that we all of us, should devote one day for each each year to smiles and kind acts throughout the world. Harvey Ball decided that the first Friday in October each year would henceforth be World Smile Day. Ever since that first World Smile Day held in 1999, it has continued every year in Smiley's hometown of Worcester, Mass, and around the world. Wear your smile pin on October 5th to make someone smile. Pay Pay it forward and do an act of kindness on World Smile Day. Nice job. Okay, so we expect many great things happening this Friday. Okay, next we have an eighth, a current eighth grader, but she's going to talk about an experience that the seventh grade shares, but they don't do that till the end of the year, so we don't have a seventh grader who can explain it to you. So come on up. And she will introduce herself. Hello, my name is Cadence Hadabaugh, and as Ms. Ciclini said, I'm a current eighth grader here at Samoset. Last year, when I was in the seventh grade, we were learning about ancient Greece and social studies. To tie in with what we were already learning, we did an activity called the Greek Olympics. We worked together as a team to try to win a variety of different events, and each event we won, we got points. At the end, whoever had the most points was declared the winner of the games. So if you look at the pictures up there, I took all of the 14 pictures that are up there. So this first picture shows the team colors. So each homeroom had their own color, and we competed as a homeroom against the other homerooms to try to win the title of the winner of the game, so to say. 
Each homeroom had a city-state name. So, for example, my homeroom was Argos, and we were in the yellow. And we all made our headbands that had our name in it in Greek lettering. <coughs> the second photo here is just like the first photo at the same event. It's just a different angle. But in this one, you can see the face paint that everyone was wearing to show the team spirit. And we, at this point, we were getting ready to start our second event, which was a relay race. In this photo, we were listening to the instructions on how to do this next relay race, which I'll explain in a moment. And it had to do with jump roping. This relay race, we had to jump rope across the gym and then around the cone and get back to our team. We would hand off the jump rope and then we kept going and we were given a certain amount of time to do this. Whoever had the most people go around the cone and come back, and I think it was five minutes, was declared the winner of this event. In this photo, you can see the flags that all of the teams made. In preparation to the games, we were told to make a flag, a song, and a team handshake. In this, you can see, you can partially see my flag, which is the one with the yellow background. And because Argos controlled the sea in ancient Greece, you can see a boat, well, you can kind of see a boat in the ocean. This was another event we did outside, and we, in this event, we sent one person down to the other side of the blacktop to hold a soda, an empty soda bottle while your other team would fill up a sponge and then run towards the soda bottle, and you'd have to squeeze out all the water from the sponge into the soda bottle. Whoever had the most, whoever filled up their soda bottle first was the winner of this event. You can see one of my peers, Joey, you can see the sponge in his hand. He had to fill up the sponge with water, like I said earlier, and he had to run across the field. This photo shows that no matter who was there and if you were hurt or at that time, or no matter what you had going on, you still participated. So Camly, you can see she has a boot on her ankle, but she still participated by showing her team spirit. This was another event in the field that we did, and you had to run through the tires, and then there was a bounce house that you had to run through. It was another race, and whoever had the lowest time was compared to all the other times of the homerooms, and out of all the homerooms, the person that had the lowest time was the winner of the games, so their homeroom would win that event. This is just another photo of that event. This was McKenna getting through the tires. Um, and we competed against our homeroom in this one, so the girls would run against the boys in each homeroom. And whoever had the lowest time of the homerooms would be compared to all the other lowest times of the homerooms, and that would be the winner. And this, you can see one of my really close friends, Kylie, cheering on her team with, she had the flag in her hand, but you can't see it in this photo. She was cheering on her team, and you can kind of see the bounce house behind. This photo was one, the one photo that got featured in the Sentinel Enterprise that I took, so... It was like a week after the event happened. The photos that I took and another photographer took got into the paper. This is a better view of my flag. And you can see the lettering at the top is Greek um, for my city state. In, in this photo, you can see the ocean and the ship. You can also see all of our names signed on the flag in Greek lettering. This was one of our teachers last year, and he dressed up as Alexander the Great. And in this photo, he was explaining how to do the event to us. 
He would also do all of the events that he told us we could do at the end when we finished to make us laugh, and it was, it made it more enjoyable. And that's the end. I can guarantee to you that all of the sixth and seventh graders know this event and they are waiting for their turn. So it's really, it's a good day for them. Okay, next, I'm sure you all know about the youth ventures that take place throughout the district, but we have two young gentlemen who had a special um, venture that they wanted to share with you and then to share their plans for this year. It's time. <laughs> Little nerves. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lucy Jolly Ray. I'm a seventh grader here at Samoset. And I'm Ryan Doyle, and I'm also a seventh grader here at Samoset. So if you guys can turn around, we'll show our presentation. <laughs> so we're part of Project Film. Our responsibilities here are. I'm Ryan again, and I'm the director. I'm Lucas, I'm the cameraman that will be doing the editing too. The idea and inspiration, to inform elementary students on life in middle school. The idea is to film interesting thing that goes on in school, in the community, and at our feeder school with Samoset students. To inform parents on what happens at Samoset Middle School. The idea came up when, when I did a broadcast in fifth grade with Miss Caudill, the media teacher at Fallbrook, I loved the project so much that I just really wanted a film club up here. And I wanted to give out information. I wanted some information before I came up here, before I came students here. Why are, ne why are ventures necessary? It will help inform elementary students the, to the transition of middle school without any worries. To, we will inform students and parents on life in middle school. It will share, share interesting events around the school via TV with our peers. Our project will give students something to watch and laugh about. It will help transfer students learn about our school. It will help new staff and teachers learn about our school community. And it will show all of our hard work. And it will show that Samoset Wildcats care. Our ally is Mr. John Federico. He was our science teacher, our sixth grade science teacher. He knew about our idea and he wanted to help. There's his contact information. Marketing. Social media and ways to market. Our Instagram is Project Film SAM. Our email is Project Film SAM at gmail.com. We'll make school announcements and send notices to parents. Sustainability. We're going to try to bring this venture up to the high school when we leave Samoset. If that, if that does not work out, we will recruit kids from Samoset that will have the best entrance of, of our school. We'll recruit students by the way of volunteer sign-up treats, making school announcement, asking the, asking the student of the month, and ask kids that were impacted by our videos. Our budgeting for our venture. So the first thing that we bought for our venture is a camera kit. This camera kit included the camera, the SD card, SD cards, cases, cables, tripods, batteries, table tripod, card reader, cleaning supplies, and a micro, and then that was it. This cost us $289.95. We also bought a microphone too, which cost us $25.99. And the Apple computer we we're waiting to buy because we do not have enough money to get the one we would like. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? There is also a video too, so we're not done yet. Oh,
while he's setting this up, I just want to tell you that the video that they made was really wonderful. The fifth graders that came up loved it. Um, they had done a section that I was in, and unfortunately, there was a glitch, and they had to cut it out. So that was like the best news I had had all day long. <laughs> because until you've seen yourself on that size screen, you just haven't lived. <laughs> so. Whoop, here we go. They actually went through all this this afternoon, huh? Google stuff. Yeah. Google, yeah. <laughs> so can I ask a question to the young man? Sure. When you submitted your um, bid for <coughs> Project Ventures, and you were awarded X amount of money. Mm -hmm. You used it to buy the camera and the microphones. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to resubmit this year. You no, know, like we're gonna uh, we're gonna do some fundraisers and like with the funds we we hope to like be able to buy uh, some better equipment for us this year. Okay, but you don't have to resubmit again for. No, okay. like we only need to re resubmit it if we want it uh, to be at the high school. So you guys are like movie producers now. I guess so. You need an, you need an agent and a contract and all that? Yeah, it's too expensive. <laughs> Well, we're not leaving until we see this. <laughs> so you better bring in some food. You have an apple right now, Ronnie. I, I was waiting for Ronnie to eat the candy bar. They worked on this this afternoon, so this was all set up already. I already so, have one. I don't know what happened. Well, we can move on and then come right back to it if you want. Is it almost ready to open, or do you know? I noticed you're using Chrome, mm -hmm. and if you get if you get another computer or an Apple. Are you predisposed to using Firefox? What's the... I'm asking you. Me? No, I'm what? asking him. <laughs> He's only the producer. I know, but people. He's got people, but Mr. Mamoni can answer that. Yeah. He's what he, him, and him are doing it. It's there, what they find easier to use. That's what I'm asking. I think just Google is just way easier because we can just put in other accounts and check it anywhere. If that's not going to work, they can just come down and finish up and just see, okay? Keep drawing. We can, we can continue on the meeting and then just right. back to when you're in. Okay. Now you've got Okay, then we can just jump to a couple of points that we were going to go to later. Uh, Mr. Oliver is also going to speak to you, but as soon as he's finished in that job, he'll come down and speak to you. The last thing that I was going to talk about while you were here was um, two events that we have coming up that just by uh, coincidence happen to fit into the district initiative, initiative excuse me, to improve social and emotional learning and growth in our students and to offer opportunities for them to demonstrate that learning and growth. The first of these is a student showcase that's going to take place this coming May. The reason I mention it now is because it's going to be a year-long process and the kids are going to begin the process this month. Traditionally, Santa said had a uh, science fair each year, and all of the kids were uh, required to take part in that. For some of them, it was a chore because science was not their first love. It may not have been their first talent. So what we decided to do was kind of take a different tack with this, and we're going to do a student showcase. If you heard one of the boys mention Wildcats Care. That care, that acronym stands for uh, the Wildcats, the students in the school being civil, they achieve, they're respectful, and they encourage. So what we decided to do was to choose the trait of courage and ask the kids now to take a look at uh, what courage means to them, whether it's a person or it's an event or it could be a structure, it could be a historical figure. We want them to decide what courage means to them and what it looks like, and then they will choose the genre that they will demonstrate that trait in. So they may 
um, look at some piece of architecture and imagine what it must have been like, say the cathedrals in the Middle Ages, what it must have been like, what courage it must have taken, first of all, to design something like that and then convince people that this was doable. But the people that built it, the people who presented the idea, and the ones who had the courage to put the money out to do it. Courage comes in all different forms. So we want them to take a look at an athlete, some kind of sport, music, anything at all, what it means to them, and then choose how they want to demonstrate it. And then at the end of May, we will have a showcase where all of the kids will be able to um, demonstrate how they viewed that, what their perception of coverage was. Okay, so we're really looking forward to that. We have two great coordinators, Jillian Santusi and Ian Castles have volunteered to coordinate this. So we're meeting Wednesday and we're gonna kick off the first couple of steps of this in the next week or so. The other event, um, our parent support group that's going to be on October 10th, Wednesday, October 10th, is gonna be here at Samoset. That came out of a conversation that I happened to have during the summer with a gentleman who had called because he had um, been granted custody of his grandson. And he wanted to make sure that his grandson would not be uncomfortable when he came to school and if kids knew that he was being raised by his uh, grandparents. That conversation stayed with me for the longest time because I had the chance to talk to him just to tell him he wasn't alone. But I started to talk with the school nurse and our new school psychologist and we were talking about how this is just district-wide, it's statewide, it's countrywide. There are so many people out there who are unexpectedly raising children again. Um, for some of us, we raised our own, we put them through school, and for whatever reasons, and unfortunately a lot of them are due to either addiction or um, any kind of trauma like that. And we have to realize that not only the child who may have you know, had their parents taken away or they were taken away, but the grandparents who are now raising them are also facing the trauma of watching their own grown children go through these circumstances. So we decided we truly wanted to offer some support. We weren't quite sure how to do that. So we thought what we would do is on this Wednesday night, we're literally going to serve them coffee and cookies, um, put some tablecloths on the tables and just let them sit and talk and ask them to tell us what they need and then we will go out and find the resources and bring them back um, and have them in again. And hopefully they may not need a particular resource, but they may be just the resource someone else needs so they can share their own information. Uh, so we're truly looking forward to it. The flyers going home this week. So um, I do have in your packet, that was a draft of a flyer. So it did say October 3rd, but it's October 10th. So it's a week from this Wednesday, and it will be right here from 6.30 to 7.30. And we are hoping to have a great response, but if it's small, we know that word of mouth will help us along, okay? And also tonight, Paula had forwarded an email uh, to me that Eileen Griffin had noticed that there is a group called Grandparents Raising Grandchildren. They're in the area, which I have not heard of them, but they do offer resources. So we'll be out there tapping every resource that we can find to bring it to whoever comes for our support. And just a note for the grandparents raising grandchildren, it really is for any kinship caregiver. Yeah. So yeah. it could be aunt, uncle, cousin, whatever. Well, that's why on the flyer we had put calling all grandparents, aunts, uncles. We had brothers and sisters here who were raising younger siblings. So it may not be that they want to know just about school, but they may forget what the college process is like or, or um, just the social media side, the angst side of being in middle school and that, so we're hoping to offer whatever support we can. And I know just with the grandparent raising grandchildren, there is um, a support group, but they also offer free trainings, and there's one coming mm -hmm. up in Fitchburg around suicide uh, prevention, and just, you know, making people aware of what to do when faced with some, you know, difficult situations. Yeah. Um, but they're all free and we would encourage people to... And I have that flyer, so we'll be printing that out to make it available on the 10th, okay? So, are we ready, gentlemen? All right, guys. Beautiful, okay. Okay, your attention that way.
I'm Mr. Oliver, student you call me Mr. Ko. I am the assistant principal here at San Jose Middle School. Yeah. I am with the Smith on the in-school suspension tutor. I'm from San Jose Middle School in Skyview Middle School. Concludes the video, but a few things we wanted to add is during the helpful tip section, which we're about to show, which we were about to show, we want to add more students' involvement, talking about what their experience in middle school was and how they would want to change it. And we would also want to change some of the product on the video, making it a lot more better quality and using a much different editing software than the one we did use. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for your time. We thank really you. appreciate thank it. You. Do you guys have any questions for us? Did you guys bring any popcorn to sell to us? A <laughs> hundred bags? A hundred bags? So have you thought about using popcorn sales to get your equipment? Well, we were actually just thinking about that, but we would probably need like a teacher's permission in order to do that, so we have to figure out that. Nice job. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. You guys did a good job. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, school committee. My name is Mr. Oliver. I'm the assistant principal here. Um, superintendent Mayor, school committee, I appreciate the opportunity to get to stand in front of you. Um, I've been in Lemonster for 27 years as an educator, and this is my first time actually being up here and speaking in front of the school committee. Um, so I want to thank Kathy for allowing me to do this as well. Um, I know Paula's thing is data, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through my data book, um, and hopefully we'll get this done by sometime in June. <laughs> Memorized. <laughs> Memorized. <laughs> um, I stand here. Kathy asked me to come up and speak um, a little bit, just two minutes, um, on MCAS um, and how Samoset did last year. Um, and the one thing that I want to say is um, Samoset went through a little turmoil last year with some changes um, in administration. Um, we had an unfortunate situation where the principal got sick. Um, and thank God she's doing better now. Um, but our staff and our parents and our students were absolutely amazing last year in sticking together, um, holding me up on numerous days um, to get through um, the first four months of school until we were very fortunate where Paula came up and did double duty as a principal down at the Hill End up here. And then I want to thank Kathy for coming on board and, and standing me back up and, and, and pushing me forward and, 
And I just, what the staff and the students did was absolutely amazing. Um, the majority of our students last year, I know I'm going to go over two minutes, Kathy, I apologize, um, but I'm kind of a little emotional about this. The majority of our students were very fortunate last year to take the MCAS on Chromebooks, um, which was, I thought was absolutely amazing. We have, um, there was probably about, we have 150 at the time Chromebooks, so we were able to put one grade per day on the Chromebooks and do our MCAS testing. Um, I have a couple numbers that I want to read out because I'm extremely proud of our students um, and staff because um, they all work together to, to put these numbers out. And these numbers you can get, obviously, but to me, um, grade six um, English um, at Samoset here um, on the online piece, uh, we were 3% uh, uh, better than the state. Um, grade seven, four percent better than the state, and in grade eight, six percent better than the state for our online testing. To me, that's absolutely amazing, and that's through the hard work that the students and the staff did here at Samoset. There is areas that we need to work on, um, but I want to go through math as well. Math, one percent better in grade six, six percent better in grade seven, and five percent better in grade eight. You did not hear me say lower than the state, you heard me say higher than the state. And science. Science has always been our tricky subject area. Um, for the online piece here at Samoset, 4% higher than the state. So I did not say lower, I didn't say met, I said we were higher than the state. So our um, students here, credit to the students and the parents for sticking with us, um, and, and especially our staff. We're not here tonight, but I always want to shout out our staff because our staff works extremely, extremely hard here at Samoset. And my last piece is, with all that data, we, we take our next goal here, and Paul actually helped us start this last year. Um, we put together a data team, and Kathy's jumped on board with it. Put together a data team where we're going to look at our MCAS results. Um, we also looked at what's called an NWEA, Northwest Evaluation Association, it's called MAP scores. Uh, we take them three times a year, um, spring, winter, and fall. Uh, we look at those scores in English, reading, and math. Um, we also look at, our, obviously, our school um, progress reports, report cards that the kids get when they come home, and look at the teachers and have the teachers um, give input. Um, and we're always, of course, finding, you know, teaching strategies that work um, here at Samosa and those that may not work. Um, we want our teachers to take risks and be risk takers. So it's okay to throw their ideas out there, so we need to see what works and what does not work. The data team consists of teachers, administrators, um, special ed teachers, any staff members that want to be part of our data team is definitely on board. Um, and the last thing, we also use what's called the Massachusetts platform called Edward Analysis, where that's a piece that not only talks about the students and their educational background, but like Kathy had mentioned, the social emotional learning of the students as well, um, which is also extremely important here. Um, Kathy told me that she would follow me so that there could be no questions and I could run off this stage. So hopefully there's no questions. If you are, you can email Kathy later tonight and she will answer any questions or I can take them right now. Oh, we can take them right now. <laughs> you certainly should be very proud. That's quite an accomplishment on all those test scores. So. It's great. Well, it is, because CMS had kind of struggled for a few years, and I think we're on the right track. So it was very encouraging to see even the slightest improvements that the teachers are they are going to feel wonderful. We're in the very beginning stages of looking at it, so we haven't really distributed much. However, that concludes our presentation. We were very happy to have you. Wendy has a question. I'm sorry, are you doing the public <coughs> the state of the testing? Yes. 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 Um, how many, do you still only have 150 Chromebooks, or have you gotten more? More. We were granted, uh, or blessed, I should say, with two more Chromebook cards, so that was an additional 60. And then through the um, DSEC grant that we had, uh, because the special education teachers, th those kids are generally good visual learners, and we felt that it was important for them to have a dedicated card, so we did purchase one through that grant for them. The, the fact that you took the, 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 the test
tests on the Chromebook online. Is that like a preview for other classes, for other classes that are just taking the MCAS online too? Mm -hmm. Well, the kids are very facile with the Chromebooks. They're sometimes better than the adults in the room. Um, so for them, when they were told that they would be taking the test online, it really didn't phase them much. Um, and that number is going to increase this year because some of the kids who were opted out for different reasons, different special needs reasons, they've also chosen, they're given the option to take it on the Chromebook too. So our number should go much higher. Do you have, do you have an idea what the number is going to be in terms of how many you be taking it? I guess this is, I'm just, I'm just throwing this up for you and the majority oh. of students will be taking it yeah. online. Majority, you mean majority, majority here or majority district. the district? Statewide. District. But I think in this school, it'll probably be very high 80%, uh, probably closer to 90. And is that like a prelude that, you know, are you looking forward that the scores will be higher? And if the scores are higher because you took them online, does that mean taking them by paper, that there was a built-in loss by paper? No, I think it's just the tool that the city is requiring us to use now. Yeah. So everybody's going just to asking, guys. Right, but everybody's moving over to the, to the computer, yeah. electronic yeah. as opposed yeah. to paper. Yeah. So we have in the future. Yeah. They're hoping results will be quicker and all of that. So, so we will probably, as a district, be at least 90% online mm -hmm. this year. We just need to keep increasing our technology. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that, that yeah, no, we're doing well. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the curriculum report. More data. <laughs> Do you need to borrow the data book? book? Yeah. <laughs> oh, she has her own. <laughs> Mine's on a little zip drive that Steve has because I couldn't carry the size of the book. So. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, we are going to be talking about the accountability system, which is brand new to the state this year. Um, as you heard from Kathy and from Nelson, each one of the schools is really digging down into what we know of as the MCAS scores or the ELA, the math, and the science questions and results for all of our children and so that's their task at this time. Um, we at the district level are working on um, what the state has now put in place and the different measures that they're going to be asking us to be looking at. So my goals for tonight are to provide you just with a, a little bit of um, understanding about the new components of the accountability system and also something they're calling targets for achievement that we will be measuring ourselves against as we move forward. Um, we talked about No Child Left Behind for many, many years, and now we're talking about every student succeeding. And part of what that change at the federal level in 2015 has allowed us to do at the state is to provide for different measures that we're going to be looking at. The the next slide is going to, um, and I believe you have them in front of you, um, indicators that provide more information about school performance. So the state is looking to move just beyond test scores. So yes, we know about MCAS, and yes, we know about student growth, but they're adding some pieces, and this will be giving you, giving you, giving all the stakeholders, and giving the community a little better understanding about how we're moving forward and some of the other things that we're looking at. So we still will be looking at achievement. We will be looking at growth. Um, one of the indicators that you do see um, very often, or every year we report on it, is high school completion. That will now be part of an overall score that our high schools and the district will use. Our English language learners will be giving, given a, um, a target to attain their um, fluency in six years. So that progress towards that attainment is going to be part of what the district will be measured on. Chronic absenteeism will also be a measure. Um, I, at the risk of misquoting and not giving the, um, the appropriate um, author 95% of success, 
is just showing up. So we need to make sure that our young people are showing up, that they're there, so that the hard work and the, um, the materials that the teachers are using will be um, promoting those children. And then the last piece is something called advanced coursework completion, and that's at our high school level again. Um, class, classwork that you may know of, such as um, advanced placement in, in other um, districts, it's baccalaureate. We also have a number of math courses that are not considered AP, but are considered high level, something like statistics, uh, calculus. So the number of students that will be taking those courses will give us some points towards our overall score when um, the state um, puts out that indicator. The next slide just breaks down quickly what they're going to measure. And going forward, they're measuring schools either on a three, grade three to eight band or a grade nine through 12 band. So here in Lemonster, our elementaries and middle schools will all be in the same pot of, of schools, so to speak. And again, you'll be, will be measured 60% uh, of this score that we will receive at the elementary and middle schools will be our MCAS scores. 20% um, will be the student growth percentiles that we've seen in the past. And then at the elementary and middle school, 10% of the score for the school will be based on that English language proficiency, and 10% will be chronic absenteeism. They define chronic as absenteeism as 10%. Yes, 10% or more, uh, missing 10% or more of their days in membership. So is that going to, um, how's that going to affect when we have a sort of a transient population? Is that going to sort of follow them wherever they go? That is a good point. Um, the, the membership, obviously, we think of the young people that are here with us, membership of 180 days. But if we have a young person who comes in sometime in November and then only stays with us for a couple of months before they move on, we need to track their membership and their total membership may be 30 days and which would mean roughly they, they can't miss more than three days or they would be chronically absent for their membership. Um, we're using a technology tool within the Google Suite that um, Steve is promoting and we're using uh, to help our schools gather that information quickly so that our administration in each building can take a quick snapshot every day and say, hmm, we've got a couple of young people here, let's call their parents, let's see what's going on, and really be proactive about getting our young people in school as often as possible. Um, at the high school level, again, MCAS and student growth, um, I mentioned the high school completion, and that's the, what we know is the four-year cohort graduation rate. There's also going to be a five-year cohort, so we will, be getting some credit for young people if they can't make it for whatever reason in the four years. If they stick to it and we work with them and get them through to their high school graduation and diploma in five years, that's also a bonus for us as well as them. And the annual dropout rate at the high school is another component of the student achievement. They'll be using um, the English language proficiency as well and then absenteeism, and as I mentioned, those um, advanced coursework, which we do have um, a large number of course selections at our high school for students who are interested in honors and AP work. Just a little bit more about the um, English language proficiency. They're calling it a non-linear path because each child is going to be measured based on the first time they take the access test, which is our, our state test for um, language. So they're gonna start wherever that initial access score places them, and then we have six years to work with them. Uh, and they'll be, we'll be getting points for moving those children forward, but it really does depend on where they start um, as an individual the number of years that they are here in Massachusetts and also what grade that they're in to start. So it's um, very much a personalized look at their language acquisition. The, um, the last piece, the targets. 
so we're going to get a score that's going to be based on how all of our schools are doing compared to the other schools in the state. And then we're going to get a score based on how we're doing compared with what we have done in the past. And those categories are going to be given to us both by our district and by our school in the aggregate to all of our children. Then there's another group called the lowest performing student group. So at each of our schools, we were given the, a breakdown of the students and where they fell on their achievement from last from the 2017 data. And the lowest 25% in each school and at the district have been identified. That cohort of young people will also receive a, a target or um, will have an initial target that we are trying to meet. So in the past, we had talked about the high needs group. Instead of high needs, we're now talking about the lowest performing group. And we look as, as an example, what percentage might that be of a population of 600 kids, 700? From what you know now, I mean, you must know that. Right, so um, at each of the schools, it really depends on um, the grade makeup of the school. What they're saying is you, you can't be looked at if you have not been in the school for more than, for less than two years. So at the elementary school, we're talking about uh, uh, third grade and fourth grade, they would have had to have taken an MCAS test. So they would have had to have taken it in third grade, have results, have been with us, and be ready to take it in fourth grade. So really we're looking at identifying young people in fourth and fifth grade at the elementary level who are considered to be our lowest performing. So if there were 200 um, students in fourth and fifth grade at a school, then we're going to be looking at 50 youngsters and we're going to know their names. Um, they may not be what we would consider low performing, but in that school, they will be the lowest of that school. And so we'll need, um, need for us to be paying close attention to them. At the middle school, it would be, um, they would have taken tests in sixth grade, they would have been with us. So again, it's only going to be the young people who've been here two years in that school. And it will also not include any of our English language learners that have been less than two years here in the country. So they will not be part of that group. They're an identified group that is, is a risk group already. So no matter what year they come in, if they come in the seventh grade and they haven't been here for two years, yeah. They will not be part of that right. lowest 25% cohort. Again, we will already have identified them through um, the access testing, and they will be having um, the, uh, we'll be looking at their results based on the ELL and their six years worth of time to become proficient or fluent in English. I, my small question is to, sure. to piggyback on Dean's question. The one that would take the, if the kid took the MCAS, the third grade, I'm, the third grader, took, took the MCAS in another school district in Massachusetts, would they be part of that, could they be part of that group? That's a good question. They would not be. Even though they had already been in Massachusetts. Right. So we're talking about the, the lowest percent, or lowest 25 percent in that school. And so they may, if we have um, students at one of our elementary schools and then they move to the middle school, depending on the achievement at the middle school, they may no longer be in the 25th percentile. Well, I, I would assume that once you, it's best to identify it at the third grade, right? Absolutely. And, fourth, and then look at what each year as you go on and with the hopes that, you know, that that group is now instead of 50 students, it's, it's zero or hopefully close to, right? Okay. I mean, and it helps us direct our services, or we have to give them all a Chromebook. Can, by the way, can you take a Chromebook home? Absolutely, you can. So you, we you get enough of them, they'll all take them home. But, <laughs> but you have access to it from, so you can take it home and have access to it. From, yes. So we may have to look at that, right? Looking at those 50 kids, at, you know, adding on to the specific areas of the Chrome um, that, that areas. Right. And then begging my second question. Yeah. Sure. The third grader would be taking the test on the Chrome? Yes. Okay, well, no, I, yes. I guess I guess I'm very dull. No. Now, would you be would you be comparing their scores with the other kids who took the MCAS last year, but it was on paper? Would you would you be doing a a, a, 
a risk benefit ratio or a comparative <coughs> contract? So the state has actually the state the state has actually done this for us on a much larger scale. They they have compared students taking a paper pencil test with students who are taking them online, and there is a negligible difference. In fact, they did find that the young people have scored a small amount higher who are taking it on the Chromebook. So they have a much larger sample size than we do here in Lemonster, and they are looking at that. Mm -hmm. So as Paula had mentioned, all of our students will be taking it. If they have the capacity, we'll be taking an online assessment, including all of our high school students this year. Um, I have a question. Yeah. I, I'm curious about the sensitivity to confidentiality for these kids in this lowest 25% in each building, because you mentioned they may not even really necessarily be low scoring, they're just the lowest of that building. Um, the, I, the, the, we know who, well, you know who they are, but do they know who they are? I mean, how is that being protected so they don't feel like the stupidest kids in the building, so to speak? Right. Um, so, as far as the state is concerned, they, um, they mandate that we suppress numbers if they're lower than a sample size of 20. So at all of our elementary and at our middle and high school, we do have a sample size that would be greater. We are looking at results for these young people. We are not labeling them, uh, but we are looking at them individually because we want to personalize their learning. And we want to make sure that our, the adults in the building also know if there's a, a child in front of them that may not present as being at risk, but we have this additional information and we make sure that the, the teachers and the support staff know about that. But it's, hand, it's being handled with sensitivity. Absolutely. But every school in the state, no matter how wealthy they are, they're all going to have that percentage of low performing students. Just because to get the success, you, you got to know where you're at, right? It's got to be. Right. And we should be paying more attention so that, sort of like the, what students were talking about earlier, right? We're in this as a team. We all want to finish, right? Yes. We all want to do this together. Yeah. So our school system ought to be doing that. So everybody yeah. gets to that. And we need to rem remind ourselves all the time, we're an urban district, we have a diverse um, student body. We're pulling children up that may need additional support, but we're also pushing those children up that are ready to, to exceed or have um, some, some of our gifted and talented or have some other positive needs. Um, and um, Mayor, you, you did mention one of the reasons they're doing this accountability piece is um, we got dinged as a, an urban district, as many did, of having a large number of high-need students. And there would be some other districts that wouldn't have those high-need students. So instead of reporting on high needs, they're now reporting on the lowest 25% in any district right. in any school. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Levels the playing field a little yes. bit. Nona? Um, on the additional um, indicators, is there anything that will that would be indicating if they're vocational versus academic? <coughs> uh, whether there's folk, you know, because there's vocational schools. Right. We have a vocational component. Yes. No. There, at this time, there is not anything that would delineate the difference between a vocational or just a, an academically focused school. Yep. Uh, just a couple more things. Um, I, I do want to say that the targets and everything that's put in place for this accountability system is based on one year's worth of data at the state level. So it is most definitely a work in progress. We can go to the next slide, please. And what has the Commissioner of Education said? Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. It's year one, so he right. has put the message out to all educators. Take a deep breath. It's year one. It's a learning year for all, for everyone. Right. So we have... Um, some accountability data at the state level. 74% of our schools across the state have been designated as not requiring assistance or intervention. All of the Lemonster schools fall within that 74% category. There are no student, I mean, no schools that require assistance of any kind in Lemonster. The overall accountability classification for districts, 90% do not require assistance. Lemonster is in that 90% category, so we are not requiring assistance or intervention at this time. That is very good. The accountability categories for schools, 
31% were categorized as meeting targets, which means that of the, the formula that they're using, they're at the 75th percentile or higher. We'll do the cheer right now. We have one school in Lemonster who is in that category of meeting targets. That's Francis Drake Elementary School. We'll do the happy dance for them. All of our other schools are in the partially meeting targets, so they are all moving forward and in, in a variety of places on that percentile um, list. And uh, as Paula mentioned, the um, new commissioner of education did say take a deep breath. They are very much telling us that we are not to compare 2018 accountability data with anything that came before because this is a completely new system. They're also telling us not to equate any of the 2018 categories with past um, accountability systems. But they are telling us, use this information and review it, and that's why we're here this evening to give you a little bit better of an understanding of some of the components that we will be working on. To be honest, we didn't have this lowest 25% um, category, or we didn't know about these students until April of last year. So we now do know about them. We didn't know what the chronic absenteeism was going to look like on this accountability system until June. So now we do know, and forewarned is forearmed, so we will be moving forward with, um, to, with work on these different components of accountability. Ron, you had a question? My, my question is the devil's question. You know, last year, I think it was last year, there was talk they were going to try and present, push, whatever have you, that a lot of these exams or MCAS, they were going to try and put them, if the person was having difficulty doing and taking the test in English, putting it in the native tongue. Is there any, did that get any traction? No? No, it yes. did not. Not in Massachusetts. Does anybody else have any other questions? Thank you for your time. Right, thank you. In your packet, you'll see correspondence from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm addressed to Superintendent Deacon, <coughs> notifying Lemonster Public Schools that they will be awarded $378,551 for the Federal Emergency Impact Aid Program, Fund Code 312. What's interesting is we knew of the proposal last spring. We weren't notified of actual funding until late September. We have to classify the expenses as of June 30th. Sort of backwards, but this all has come about in the last week and a half. On Friday, Superintendent Deacon, myself, financial analyst Melanie Michaels, and our consultant Sean McGoldrick participated in a one-hour conference call with representatives from around the state as to how we're going to do this. And fortunately, we have not yet completed our end of year report, which was due Friday, and um, the city has not yet classified its balance sheet with the state and determined its free cash. So while others were complaining that they'd have to redo their reports, we didn't have to. We just have to get some cooperation with the city in reclassifying expenses and trying to put funds back in um, our revolving funds so that we can spend them this year. Are there any questions? This is good news. Good news. Are you getting any pushback or is are you from the city? <laughs> I know. We've received no answer so far. So you've reached out to them, but you haven't heard it. It was the mayor and the conference were invited to participate, and the conference called us to ask to join us in the superintendent's office. If they didn't join us, maybe they listened in from City Hall. What's the clock on this? We have to do everything by the end of December. Otherwise, otherwise the funds go away. Right. So we clearly don't want to give the money back. Um, well, that would be a travesty. We won't get the money. 
we have to do the documentation, apply for a grant, show the funds were expended, and we'll give it to us in one allotment. We already have a plan in action as to where we'd like to see those funds reclassified. We can't do this without the cooperation of the state. Well, unfortunately, the mayor has stepped out for a He's back. Oh, he's back. Right. So we were just talking about it. Um, if you want to give a very brief sure. um, recap for the mayors. Uh, Last spring, uh, communities in the Commonwealth across the country actually were notified that the federal government was intending to provide federal impact aid for students from various disasters, <coughs> primarily Puerto Rico. We had um, 63 students on average from Puerto Rico that came here. Most of them didn't transition from here. They stayed through the course of the year. And based on the number of days they were enrolled and the rate at which the federal government wants to provide support, uh, we're going to get $378,551. To get that money, we have to do a grant application and make sure that those funds were considered as expended as of June 30th, 2018. So retroactively, it's a little bit backwards than it usually happens. So we have to do an application and class, make sure that those expenses are reclassified. And we need the cooperation of, of city comptroller to go ahead and do those accounting transactions. So are they going to direct um, fund right into the city's account? Well, ideally, it would be like school choice and revolving funds, that the money comes to the city and then it's transition over to one of the school's revolving funds, preferably school choice. But they're going to direct deposit into our account. Yes, the city. Yeah, they and deposit. Then we have to just reappropriate it? Uh, yeah, I guess that would be the best way to do it. Y yes, it would be the best way to do okay. it. So we appropriate those funds once we know that, that we, the grant is accepted. And just we need the support of the comptroller as we venture into reclassifying funds that were spent three months ago. So you're going to go back and look at the fund, where you spent your funding, yes. and, and you have that in that big data book that you got over there. That's so that's my, that my data book right? would never be that big. And then we okay. just reclassify those expenses. So you're going to break them down a little more thorough. It's the same way we have to uh, explain to the federal government and our auditors how we expended those funds. Mm -hmm. okay. The legitimate expenses related to the students from Puerto Rico. That doesn't sound complicated to me. But the funds have to be spent by, or the funds have already been spent. Already been spent. Okay, so it's good, but it's going to be a reimbursement. Right? Yes. So that money that comes in as a reimbursement will be reallocated. It doesn't have to be put back towards any specific areas, or it does. No, it. it it's just like, as you said, it has to be reappropriated. But does it have to go directly back to the uses that we said we used it for? No. All right. So if we say we used it for tutoring or we used it for special ed, it doesn't have to be used for those. Correct. Okay. So the, I guess the real key is there is a deadline. It's time um, so it's time sensitive. So you and the comptroller need to you know, work together rather quickly so that this all gets done uh, so we can get the reimbursement. Do you have a copy of the grant application? We haven't done it yet. We are still to determine. This was all discussed on Friday. Do you have a copy of the application? We would have it. We'll get, the, we'll right, get that. Just send it over so I can see it. Okay. We can get prepared. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. So that will be wonderful moving forward. What's the drop dead date on? Uh, if we don't provide the documentation to the state in time, uh, we will lose the funds. Yeah, the but I guess what's, what's, the, what's, what's the, the drop dead date? date? December 30th. December 30th? What? December 30th. December 30th. We'll preferably, we do it in the next couple of weeks. Right, right. We'll do it way ahead of time so we're not behind the eight ball there. Is so the clock's ticking. Clock, okay. yes. Right, thank you very much, Glenn. Thanks. Thanks. All right, moving forward, we are going to subcommittee reports, policies, or anything to report? There is nothing new to report from policy for this. Thank you. Finance? I know you had one. Yeah, today we have some warrants to approve, and um, I think uh, this is where we need to talk about the end of year report. So, no. Do you have warrants? Or do? Yes. Yeah, we have okay. warrants. Yep. Are you going to do warrants first, or I think she do just. Well, do you have a preference? It's up to you. You're Let's just do the warrants first. Get them out of the way. Perfect. Okay. 
Okay, I make a motion that we accept the warrants as follows. <coughs> warrant, warrant 9, $2,687,192.89. <coughs> warrant 10, $120,278.43. Warrant 11, $2,230,074.89. Warrant 12, $359,461.66. Out of the grant and revolving funds. Warrant 9, $119,149.49. Warrant 10, $95,935.94. Warrant 11, $100,498.82. And warrant 12, $22,636.66. Do I have a second? I'll second. Sue will second. Um, any questions, comments? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. The second issue that came up is that the end of year report is due to DESI uh, yesterday. Uh, we, in order to complete that, we're waiting on the, um, some things from the city, the uh, accounting of the indirect charges for last year, and... Um, I know he's working on this, but he's right. got... Now we just added another thing, so he's, his file is getting higher. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, has had any chance to look at the indirect charges? He's going, that he's suggested going through. Yeah, he's going through. Them. But at the same time, we're doing borrow, you know, we're doing borrowing from the police. So he's, he said, just be, take deep breath. He said, so does that mean a couple of days, a couple of weeks? Do you have any kind of ballpark well, on the time frame? I, I mean, I just heard tonight yeah. we're going to need the comptroller to go and reclassify everything. That just adds to the to the pot. So I think you have to decide which. So do you want to continue on that or uh, answering the, the indirect cost or working on that? I mean, that's going to have to prioritize. Right? I mean... Right. Although, certainly the indirect charges he's had for a while and, you know, was we were hoping, I guess, that he was working on that already so that we could meet the deadline. So, you know, I don't know how long that actually takes, but... Hopefully he'll be able to dedicate some time to that, and then, you know, that just takes a couple of days, and then move on to the... Well, I don't know. So I, 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 it's nice I mean, I if you can make it, it sound that easy, but he's got... Ton, I mean, there's so much that needs to be done, so I gave it to him, and he's methodically going through each... I mean, it's like five, six pages, going through each, every one of them, and he's going to answer every one of them. All right. So I guess if we can just have, um, you know, a sense of how long it's going to take, that would be just helpful, um, and that way you know, we'll be prepared to move forward once we get the information, but we won't be bugging you if we know it's going to take two weeks or, you know, three weeks or two days, whatever it is. Just give us a sense. That would probably be helpful. Wendy? Is there any fallout from this being late? So, um, well, there can be. Uh, we tried submitting the report without the city part last year, and they promptly sent it back. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. uh, there can be fallout. It's there is a potential if if we're late enough that uh, Chapter 70 payment could be withheld um, from the state to the city until we get the paperwork done. They threatened that last year. I don't know if they would have followed through or not, but they did threaten that in December last year. So, so hopefully we can avoid that. Yeah. Okay. There was so far over in the millions <coughs> of net school spending. That right. That we're not worried about. Uh, that. I'm just saying. Right. So they're not gonna. You know, we're down to the technical pieces of the chargebacks. They're, they're, we're not in one of those communities that are panic-stricken about whether we properly fund it or not. Right. So it's just more, you know, the technical. Right. You know, no. I, I just, I guess I just need to either inquire or just make a comment that I'm going on almost five, six years of being on the school committee, and every year it's been the same thing, even even from the the when I was elected and hadn't taken the oath of office yet, coming to a school committee meeting in December, we were still talking about getting this end of year report that's due in the end of September, having it go through. It's been every year. What why what is the holdup that it's... We, we don't have... No, no, we don't have the staffing that the school department has. 
there's one controller, and he's got uh, two, two and a half, uh, two uh, full-time clerical, and that's the department. And there's one part-time person. There's no assistant. There's no assistant in there. So if we want to move things along, then we have to appropriate the necessary funds, which we don't have, to hire new people to speed things up. So he's, he's a he's the you know, controller. But if you know a report to do every year at a certain time, at the end of September, why... It, it, because there's, there's a number of reports that, that are due. I mean, there's one control. He has to oversee the entire city. But to go so, from September 30th to December 30th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just, just a lot yes. of work. We don't, listen, if you want to compare the staffs at City Hall versus here, and we have one HR director, there's no secretary, no clerical people, that's that way with every single department. So you've got one person for the whole city for the whole city. And it's a good thing we have the chargebacks or we wouldn't be able to afford him. I mean, we're really down, we really run that narrow and thin on staff. So he has to take what's most important. And there are other things that come up that are more important, like internal borrowing or bonding, so we get a better yeah, rate. The city then that has to be done first. The amount of money that this city has mm -hmm. and deals with, that you would have an assistant. We don't, we, we, we don't have the funding for an assistant, or we would. We don't have an assistant treasurer. We don't have people or assistant HR director. We just, don't have like a said, lot of a staffing, on. and so we do the best we can. When something comes in, he prioritizes it. He pushes it aside if something's more important. And now we've got this other thing to do to re recategorize it, and, and he'll do it. I mean, I don't tell anybody else how to do their job. I understand. I see how he works. He's got a lot on his table. He'll, we'll get that report in. We do it every single year. The state has never called me and said they were really panic-stricken about getting this particular report in. And, and, and we always confirm our numbers are always right when we do submit them. So if he takes a little longer to make sure he's got the right numbers, rather than in the past, we've had numbers submitted to the state that were, weren't correct, which created a lot more innovation. I just assume, take a little longer, make sure the numbers are right, and that's less work for everybody. But Wendy? there's plenty of work for him to do, so I, he'll, he'll get I'm, it. I'm curious because I would imagine that this amount doesn't drastically change from year to year. So would there be less, I mean, aren't we working off of an assumption of what it was last year with, it, with maybe an increase? So it's not necessarily starting from scratch. So it wouldn't be late every year. Are you talking about that? Yeah, that piece that's. He said just, if what we've done in the past is just assume a three to five percent increase somewhere along the line. And as long as you do that, you're always all set. That's what we've typically done. I think we're now talking about two different things. Okay. There are two pieces we need. One is the accounting of the actual okay, indirect report. charges right. for 18. Right. So we can't, that can't have assumptions. That's got to be a correct right. accounting. Right. No, the and actual that's what number. we're waiting for. Right. right. And that's, that's the key thing for the report. For next year, we're supposed to, as part of our report, have show that we had an indirect charges agreement at the beginning of the year to compare this to. We haven't, our auditor has dinged us for not having that. So the chargeback agreement, the indirect charges agreement we're asking for for 19 is not part of this year's report, but it's supposed to be part of next year's report. So if we don't get that, that's where some are. Right. No, but my, my question actually is because um, the mayor said that part of what's taking so long is that the controller has so much work to do. But are this, this bill of charge, this these expenses, I can't imagine that they changed so drastically from year to year that you would think each year's prior would be a skeleton to start from and then adjust. So it, it should, it doesn't feel like it should be taking this big delay to get the new one because it shouldn't be starting from scratch every year. No, we're talking to the, you're talking, you're talking the year end report? I'm talking about the piece that we're waiting for. The year end report. Charge, the charge the charge so, so he's got to make sure, I mean, he's got to balance this all up. That's his responsibility, is to make sure that every category is correct and the numbers jive. Just like the year end report, end report for the close out of 20 for this past school year. You can say we spent $300,000 somewhere. He has to go back and verify that to make sure that we spent $300,000. We didn't overspend. So that's something he's working on right now, that, to make sure that our encumbrances are all correct. That's so. He, 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 Somebody has to say which thing they want them to do first, because there's three different reports that are due. So, and, and now you've just added this other piece. So you have to decide. 
I'm amazed at how everybody wants to tell us. So we don't tell anybody here how to do their job. No, I'm amazed. No, no, hold on. I'm amazed at how everybody has an answer and wants to tell everybody else how to do their job. He's a really qualified controller. I think he, I, I trust in him. He knows what he's doing, and he has to prioritize things. Right. So if if the, if you if somehow or another you you feel he's not doing his job, that's fine. But uh, he's a really qualified guy, and yeah, he's trying to, to prioritize the it. And, We're not okay, his and, and and he's got a lot on his plate. I think I said that for the opening, but didn't seem to suffice. He has a lot of work to do. A lot of pieces that are circulating around. All the reports always get in. I've never got a letter from the state saying that they weren't going to continue funding us or that we didn't meet our net school spending. Never had one of those letters. It's never happened. I think, you know, this particular, you know, year we've been trying very hard to have all of our fiscal uh, responsibilities and encumbrances, uh, you know, just uh, in order, laid out more so than any other, you know, previous years. So I think, you know, we're paying extra attention and wanting everything to be done and, as and, timely as possible. And if you remember, so. so are we. And we tried to bring certain information to the school committee, the school department in the past. He's being cautious too. So um, I see what he does. I meet with him daily. There's a, a ton on his table. He's moving as fast as he possibly can without any errors. That's the safest way to explain it. If people here doubt what he does, he gets criticized. I, you know, that's fine, but I, I'm comfortable with what he's doing, and I know he's doing the work. He's there every day. He doesn't yeah. take any time I mean, off. I don't think anybody's doubting he's doing the work. I think we're just, just trying to yes. figure out, About you know, time. a time right. frame and yep. you know, how we can move forward. So, Mike, is there anything else from the finance subcommittee? I believe that was it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next. Uh, is approval of the minutes? There's Motion there's approval of no minutes. Well, I don't think they were included. No, no, no. I haven't watched the video. Okay. So we're going to table so that and that. do it yeah. uh, next time. We'll do two minutes. Um, so action items. We need to vote on the resolutions for our uh, MASS and MASC conference coming up in November. So if folks want to, uh, and Ron has nicely agreed to be our delegate once again. So resolution one is rejecting the arming of educators. Um, do folks want to just take a second to read this or how would you like to proceed? Do we want, are we, did people review this? Are we ready to vote? I read them. I read them. Okay. So res resolution one is rejecting the arming of educators. Um, people who are in support of this resolution, which would be to reject it, um, raise your hand. Anybody opposed? Nope, motion carries, Ren. Um, resolution two is small and rural districts. Um, this doesn't necessarily pertain to us quite directly because we're not small or rural. <laughs> Um, but in any case, uh, if everybody is in favor uh, of this, um, raise their hand. We don't necessarily we don't. have to have an opinion on ones that aren't applicable. applicable. I didn't know whether we needed to just vote on all of them. No. But we'll do a straw poll anyways. Um, everybody, I think most people raise their hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the resolution three is elimination of the Federal Department of Education. Um, which is always interesting. I'm, I'm, not sorry. So, I'm not so sure that we have any control over that. Um, can we eliminate the head of the Department of Education? Okay. That, we could I we switch that by to somebody else. The wording is a little um, misleading because the resolution is to be to reject any notion of, <laughs> of eliminating the Federal Department of Education. So. Yeah, we don't want to eliminate that. Right. So people who are in favor of this don't want to eliminate it. That's All those in favor? Okay. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Resolution four is regional school transportation. Again, that does not affect us. Um, resolution five is recording the accountability standards. Can we go back to regional school transportation? Sure. Yeah. We're probably as big as a lot of the, the districts. Absolutely. So there might be districts that are five and six communities. We're 30 square mile. We're just about as big as them. We should, Ron, try to get this amended to either square miles or something that would reflect a, a city right. our size. Let me just write that down. You, not, want, you want it changed? Yes. 
to what? Any to community the, over the, 20 square feet? Because the, 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 uh, land mass. Change. Over 20, 20, square 20, miles. 20 square miles. To, to 20 square miles? Over. Yeah, 20 over. Square miles over. over. All right. It will get done. Because I'll have so much fun doing this. Because somebody's going to get called to go out there and bail Ronnie out. I you tell them you're going to. You tell them, Ron, you're going to read the data book. Bring that data book with you until it gets done. I, 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 I have to caution you guys. No matter how we vote on this, I'm telling you right now, there's going to be somebody there. They're going to try and change all the wording. Right. And you're going to try to change it on this one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because know, they're really just, I, 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 when they yeah. took away our yeah. state yeah. funding for transportation, yeah. hence yeah. all of our This particular issues. resolution just calls for them to, the state to do something about the lack of competition, which might benefit right. us, regardless of whether it says transformation. Oh, I agree. It, we, we definitely could use some help with transportation. They cut us by half a million, cut us out completely. We need to get back in there. That's a half a million we could be putting towards other things. So are you going to support that or not? So we are going to... We want to change? I guess we want to change it is what we were asking yes. to do. And we want to support the change. Okay. okay. Resolution 5. Uh, reporting and accountability standards, which is basically what we were just talking about. Any... Uh, people want to support that? All those in favor? So, anybody, anybody opposed? Mm -hmm. that, that that private school. Usually, this resolution do stuff doesn't pay that tuition. Ever come to fruition? Um, resolution six is reproductive health education. Um, this is really to help people make healthy and choices about their bodies and relationships. Uh, all those in favor of supporting it? Any opposed? No, nope. motion carries. Uh, resolution seven is gender identity inclusive athletic participation policy. Um, this is basically maintaining safe environments for all students, uh, no matter what their gender identity or sexual preference is. Anybody, all those in favor? Anybody opposed? No, we support that. Motion, uh, let's see, resolution eight, sports <laughs> wagering. Um, Are we going to start betting on? We should, should not be, and, no. we should not be <coughs> betting. Friendly handshake. So is um, this using like legal funds? funds. Like, sort of like the lottery, it's supposed yes. to go to education, right. but yeah. sports betting? Yeah, the resolution is the, resolution is the end. If the general court enacts legislation to legalize wagering on sporting events, then the general the, court should also commit a portion of the revenues generated yeah. from sports wagering right. to public education. Yeah, I got that. Mm -hmm. It's just the way they word it. It's, it's not very clear. clear. So all those in favor, if they do, we want the money. Um, access to information for parents and students who are clients of special education. Really has to do with the, the Disabilities Education Act yeah. um, to make available free and appropriate public education yeah. to children with disabilities yeah. and let the family have access to that information. Okay. All those in favor? Okay, passes. And there's the a proposal to amend the MASC bylaws, which submission date it's resolution. Right. So I don't know. And I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a comment. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's a lot of It's a lot of It's not an and It's just a deadline moving. Right, right. so I don't They must have a matter. We'll yeah. do it yet. So we'll say yes to that. Together artificial thing. Yeah. So, so this perfect. is the best they could come up with this year? This Nothing in here about yes, they can come up here with it. But I, I mean, like, the teacher, the, the, so they couldn't come up with, like, let's get back to the foundation budget yeah. and fixing it? They couldn't come up with that? No, because we had to talk about guns and teachers. That's like the right. priority of everything right now. I mean, clearly tonight, by, yeah, by Lauren's presentation of, of, you know, yeah, with a baseline, the percentage over or whatever, but clearly we're in a different world than, than the word urban school systems with different needs. different needs and yet they just keep passing the thing along and it 
it's not fair. And other communities, I tell you, I went to a mayor's meeting the other night, and their communities are really struggling to get year to year, and it's sad. And then nobody's doing anything about it, and they're just sort of fine-tuning it. It's pretty sad. It doesn't, they didn't make it in the Mass Association of School Committees. High agenda should be the first thing on the list. So maybe next year, and we have a whole year of plans, maybe we offer a few, you know, we've been busy, so, but in defense of us, but maybe we offer a few things that we can get some support from the other urban school districts, and we try, right? We just give it a shot, and yeah. the worst they can do is turn it down. 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 They might even pass one if we word it correctly. Yes, that's not so ambiguous. Well, just no. because it doesn't, there's not much in here that relates to urban no. school districts. Not at all. Right. Um, we got wrong, so. I have 100% confidence you're wrong. Yeah. Is there any newer old business? Mm -hmm. so, I just moved this. I just wanted to announce that the um, Lemonster Lions Club is partnering with the Lemonster High School Theater Company, and we are doing a murder dinner. This is our fifth annual murder dinner, and it's called Murder in the Air, H-E-I-R. Yeah. And Isabel was in it two years ago. And nice. Nona's participated, but it's a really fun event. It's a costume meatball supper and uh, $25 per person. Want to put a plug in? And the proceeds are split between the school yeah. and the community. So, um, you know, if right. anybody wants tickets, I have when them. When is it? Excuse October me? 18th. It's yep. going to be at the Elks, right? Yep. What time? To nine. I already know what it is. Delorean. 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 Suggestion that we put on for the next, before December, on our agenda, if there's time to have Mr. Fiandaka come in and to talk about maybe the possibility of getting the um, school building project, um, new house project, maybe back on. Because if we are going to do, and if there's any interest in building a new house, like they used to do, we would have to get people in the queue real soon because they would have to have a piece of land, you know what I mean? Or even if we didn't do it this year, maybe next year. But we have to start thinking about whether or not the school, or the school department wants to participate. Or but it's a program we offer for so many years and then we got away from it for good reasons. But, um, you know, the affordability part is here now and there isn't much land, but maybe there are some places that, um, you know, some land we might be able to find to, Cue them in for maybe next year's project or maybe the year after. So let's see if there's any interest between the superintendent and, and at least have a conversation and then go from right. there. Right. We need to see what's on their agenda as well and what they right. are capable of putting on. Yeah, so. but, but people in town have asked about yeah. the program and I said, well, you know. It's, He's asked about it as well. Yeah, so yeah. at least we right. can give everybody an answer, right? right? You seem to be fully staffed now or mm -hmm. mostly staffed, so. Any other new world business? I just was wondering, I know I had heard, I saw in the paper somewhere, what's been going on with the, with Lincoln School? I know there was a good talk about that was going to be all put in regarding the um, building for the police department. Well, it, what's, it, what's once the um, environmental tests are back, then we'll know better on that building. We'll necessarily need it for the police station, but it would be nice to have. And I can't think of anything else that we do with it. At this point, there's no parking. Um, so we'll go back to the council to have them declare it surplus. Yeah, and once it's declared surplus, what happens? It's, a, it's, not, in a, it's not in the school district chain anymore, nope. right? No, then we just, it would be part of the overall bid to tear everything down over there. And the, the district's not going to have anything to do with tearing it down, right? Yeah. Unless you want to break or something, no? no. <laughs> well, it's just that I don't want it to come back and all of a sudden we're asked, what are you going to do with it? No, there's another gun storage I, tank there. I mean, it, it's costly to tear down, but yeah. it, is, it isn't going away. So it's part of the overall pro project. We've said that we don't need it. We've I know, but I so don't know. Previously, so it's not. Unless we find a bundle of money in there, and it's to come back to the school. You might yeah. want it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I did very much. Wait a minute. We don't want it. No, it's hot. No. Yeah, that's counterfeit. Motion to adjourn. All right. Second. Thank you very much. We'll see everybody in a couple weeks.